Hello, citizen of the world, or citizens. My name is Abby Bella, and this is The European Show. Uh, I hope you're new one-stop shop for transcontinental politics, society, and the occasional scandal or scandals. It is 100 seconds to uh, midnight on the doomsday clock, and this is what's been happening in Europe uh, recently. Franz Timmermans, and he's kind of on the right side of history a lot of the time in the European Union. He's another seasoned, this is definitely a very, very seasoned and well-pickled uh, European politician. He is um, kind of on like on the labor labor side, labor party side, kind of like left side in, in the European Union. Um, he's also a vice president of the European uh, Commission at the moment. And uh, yeah, Fred Timmermans, he's been kind of going around saying a lot of things about climate change. And uh, in light of all the discussions that the European Union has been having and agreeing upon in terms of the a Green Deal, uh, this is all very topical. Um, but he's been he's being very dramatic about it. And uh, I think it's good that he is. And I think that's a very positive thing. Um, but I have a few bones to pick with him and in terms of what he's saying and some of the takes that are coming from Timmermans uh, because I think a lot of it is kind of shilly, uh, neoliberal. Um, there's a lot of neoliberal traps there and a lot of uh, violence being done to the people of Europe and the people of the world. Um, so let's take a look at what's actually being said by Timmermans. Uh, on April 30th, um, we have in The Guardian, uh, we have a whole exclusive. Uh, they did an interview with Timmermans and he, um, the, the title of the article, in fact, is, um, to be precise, the title is Climate Crisis. Our children face wars over food and water, EU deputy warns. Okay, so this is like the uh, wars over water, uh, little slip from Kamala Harris uh, in April over this as well. This is kind of out there, kind of circulating, making the rounds, these like ideas about people getting serious about what's actually happening and what truly awaits us uh, way sooner rather than later uh, and definitely the next generations. People are, get, people are getting serious about it. The uh, big politicians are, are getting not just serious, but a little bit more transparent on it because, um, you know, like the idea of w water being uh, scarce very soon and that being something that people will value and probably fight over, that's been, that's kind of a known. It's just the fact that it's being said out loud is the kind of, that's another kind of historical cultural demarcation of our civil civilization, I believe. Um, it's like this point. We're we're seeing it now. We're witnessing this this kind of breakage of the facade, and people are just saying it out loud now. That you know the apocalypse is coming. Um, so that's like the uh, sexy title: wars over food and water. Um, and then there's interesting things in there. Um, he, he says, um, sometimes, uh, he says, I wonder whether we are aware of the transformation we're heading to and how profound it is. It's an effort compa uh, comparable to restructuring after a violent conflict. I used to talk to my grandparents and my parents about how they saw this after the war, the war, World War II. They said, we sacrificed a lot because we knew our children would be better off. And this feeling is not there yet in our society. Oh, okay. So I have a lot of problems with this. And I'll come back to this a few times yet. But it's like, you know, things like... And the article is full of stuff like this and crap. Basically, um, the other big point that he made was that... Kind of pertaining to this is... Well, we, if we want our children not to fight over food and water, we need to make sacrifices for them today. Basically saying that this generation needs to sacrifice itself for the generation to come. And like he says, we just don't have that in our society. People don't want to sacrifice themselves. He's, you know, naughty, naughty little people not wanting to sacrifice themselves for other people's children. Terrible. 
So that's the take. Um, as you can see, the ever-present, <laughs> not very subtle, uh, blaming the victim situation here, the powers that be not that interested in uh, delving that deep into these structures and why they might be to blame for it, Timmermans personally, for kind of delaying things a lot. Um, no, 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 it's, it's the little people. They just don't know how to sacrifice themselves. Um, but that's not the only place where Timmermans uh, is talking about this. Um, this is kind of coming up over and over again throughout April, April 26th. We have an article in Project Syndicate. This is uh, Timmermans and Josep Burrell. Josep Burrell is uh, the uh, defense chief, uh, uh, sorry, uh, foreign uh, chief in the European Union. Um, and here they talk about, they make a really interesting point. This is like mask off, like, this is mask off at this point. It's, it's fascinating. Um, it's fascinating. I, I really like, I've come to a point where it really is just like, just enjoying the, the, the kind of shocking flavors of end times moments, uh, in the news. Um. But listen to what they're saying. They're saying, so this is both of them. These are two like major chiefs in the European Union. And they're saying by tackling the climate and biodiversity crises, everyone will be better off thanks to better jobs, cleaner air and water, fewer pandemics, and improved health and well-being. But as with any broad transition, the coming changes will upset some and benefit others creating tensions within and between countries. And they specifically mention Russia because Russia, obviously a major exporter of uh, fossil fuels, majorly dependent on that. So they make a point of saying, well, Russia's not gonna like it, which is kind of neither here nor there. Like we all know the situation, Russia knows the situation, you know the situation. I'm more disturbed by the way that they're kind of just glossing over the fact that it's like, well, it's not about that country, it's about the people of Russia, isn't it? It's about their welfare and making sure that they're safe in this global world um, in our late horrifying contemporary moment. Uh, and not just the people of Russia, but the people uh, who are part of the European Union, who Timmermans admit will not all of them will benefit some their lives will be upset they um may need to find new jobs not everyone will be making more money some people may not recover from that where is the help why, why aren't we talking why isn't this article article talking about well don't worry people because we're working hard to make sure that you're all safe and you don't have to worry about survival and this new era will mean that we not only survive but thrive and we use um, artificial intelligence and all the technology that we have for good and not for evil. But no, it's kind of like putting out these little, well, you know, it's going to be problematic. Maybe there's going to be a war here or a war there. Who knows who's going to be fighting over water because fossil fuels is not going to be, it's not going to be a commodity anymore. Just to let you know, you know, uh, in case you forgot, Russia is going to be involved. <laughs> and yeah, we promised, like he said, like this, like it's, it's just so kind of, it's just, it's insulting to the people of Europe to, to say things like at the same time, it's just kind of gaslighting. Yeah, everyone's gonna be better off. Yeah. It's gonna be cleaner water, better air, everyone will be better off, apart from the people who won't be better off. Where it will cause upset. Those people won't be better off, but everyone else, everyone will be better off, apart from the people who won't be. Excellent. Excellent. Um, Terrymans also gave a speech in March uh, to Eurogas, and this was um, the same kind of inspirational, you know, um, this big moment is coming, we must do something now, or we will self-destruct, etc., etc., etc. And then he kind of just kind of um, very briefly went over the different kind of ways and measures that these changes will, will be taking place. Uh, he went into sustainability, uh, uh, different um, oil and gas corporations, and then he went into individual people. And uh, that uh, is relevant to when he was talking about transport, ga um, uh, heating and housing. Um, the uh, Green Deal in Europe is looking at uh, transforming various cities into these uh, green 
um, architectural green creations, these ideal green spaces. Uh, which is great and I think we should do it like now uh, what I don't think we should do is we should make people poor people little people pay for it um, I don't think that should happen and poor people uh, little people like me maybe like you I don't know maybe you're really uh, important and rich but uh, most people are not one of the one or five percent and they are going to suffer and the way that the the class system works in Europe at the moment in most places in uh, Euro Anglo America in the West um, Everyone's like everyone is like not even a paycheck away from disaster like a few days of not working You're three or five six different jobs. So you have um, We're constantly all of us on the precipice of disaster uh, so any big transformation in uh, ob this is like all obvious I know but it's like I just I can't believe that like someone like Timmermans would like so brazenly kind of just like weave that stuff in there and he makes some really good points overall about how this needs to happen now that we're deluding ourselves that we're lying to ourselves that some of these changes they're not coming in 2050 which is the deadline for the European Union to be green this is like 20 we're talking 2030 it's already 2021 look how quickly this has escalated um the the climate crisis has escalated he's right this is coming in 2025 2035 not 2050 but there are ways of doing it without like telling the uh, the normal people that it's their fault and that somehow they need to kind of prepare for the worst and just hope for the best and that the, the world is going to change completely and dramatically within like a decade. And they need to just, you know, they just need to learn how to sacrifice themselves like the people in World War II. <sighs> Okay, but here's some nuggets of um, boomer wisdom that uh, Timmermans is sharing with us. So uh, when he was talking to Eurogas in the speech, uh, he mentions um, he mentions transport and he mentions things like driving cars. And he says this, part of it is psychological. Instead of thinking, what car will I buy? People must be thinking, how can I get from A to B? and picking their transport options accordingly. But I, for one, know perfectly well how emotionally tied we are to our cars. But I do see with the youngest generation, if I look at the millennials, but especially Generation Z, they have a completely different attitude towards cars and transport. <laughs> oh God, oh, because so it's psychological. I didn't know, you know what, like, Ah, all we need is some corporate sponsored therapy, some cognitive behavior therapy, right? Like, um, to battle this horrible situation that we're in. I didn't realize it was, it was just psychological. It's a, it's like a psychological, um, thing. It, it, maybe, maybe there's like an antidepressant we can all take for that or some other f f pharmacological cure from the psychological industrial complex. It's psychological. It's it's the people holding us back. There's like this like flavor to this when he said oh, it's psychological. It's because you like your cards. How patronizing can you be when you're talking about such big important things? There's like all different generations who have different attitudes to cars. One thing is for sure, Timmermans is right. Probably his generation is is the most guilty of this. The reason why a lot of millennials aren't attached to their cars isn't just because they're conscious of the environment, which they are, but another really good reason for why they're not is because they can't afford cars. This some of the like this is so taken out of any kind of like context of people's lives and it just ignores and gaslights people's actual suffering because it's it's a constant struggle and and for a lot of millennials, they don't it's not that like you don't have like a good job. You have a pretty good job, but you're still struggling. And you're always a few steps away from disaster and that's just been the case and he's just completely ignoring this He's completely ignoring how screwed Gen Z has been also by the same system and, and by the same um, Legacy of 
American psycho style capitalism uh, that we inherited from the boomers. This just leaves a bad taste in my mouth because it's always like ever so, you know, slightly pushing people to take the blame on themselves. And and if the people are the problem, if little people like like me are the problem, then we have to be a part of the solution. We have to be sacrificed. And then he mentions housing, saying that it doesn't have to be like, you know, big leaps. It can be little steps with in terms of like housing installation and stuff like that. But again, this is something the government, this the structure of this government, um, and by government, I mean the general way that our world and different parts of the world through different um, uh, bodies of governance and modes of governance has been uh, controlled, has been uh, produced as a body politic. People have the, the, the kind of installation they have in their houses because that's what you've been giving them and selling them. That's the kind of corporations you've been investing into, fossil oils, uh, fossil fuels, fossil oils, fossil fuels, and um, other types of non-sustainable energy. You, you're talking about cars. Like, that is what you've been selling people. This is like such an important part of European investment and such a, a, an important part of uh, capitalism. It's just like producing all this crap. Stop producing the cars. Don't subsidize the car companies. Why don't they make the sacrifices? They can they can afford to make the sacrifices. Let it be let it be them, not the little people who just want to get along and survive and try and like eke out some kind of a pleasurable living for a few years while they're on this earth in these difficult times. It's just so ah, uh, I really don't like this. And then he ended the speech with justice it's like a whole like section there um this is the just transition so timmerman says um we must ensure that this transition is just or there just will be no transition hmm interesting we need to make sure that all the money we put in there will make it possible to leave no one behind Okay, good. And I think this is extremely important because if you look at the political spectrum across the European Union, if people have the impression they will be left behind in this transition, they will prevent this transition from happening. Oh, that's why they can't be left behind. So it's in everyone's interest that they, that we leave nobody behind. Okay, there's like my BS meter is just going crazy off the charts. Um, yeah, there will be a transition, whether it's just or not, and that's just the truth of it. When has when have the governments of the world uh, asked us our opinion or tried to get us on board with anything? Never. When they bailed out the banks, they didn't consult us. It happened in spite of us, next to us, that have nothing to do with us, especially in the European Union. We must ensure that this tra transition is just or there just will be no transition. BS! No! There will be a transition and it won't be just. It all depends on how this is negotiated. It all depends on how much power people finally understand that they actually have so we can so pressure can be put on these people, on the powers that be, and spending can actually be put into places where it needs to be put and penalties can be put on the big corporations not on actual people but it's again and it's kind of blaming this is blaming the people again and kind of insinuating that you know people might not want to transition maybe it's psychological it's like a psychological problem that people don't want to transition you know they don't care about the environment because they're maybe they're ignorant um, and they need to be somehow, you know, we have to have them on board because we can't trust them to be on board. Listen, people are on board with this. Everyone, and including boomers, silent, silent generation, I don't know, like the undead from Count Dracula, the undead to tiny babies. Everyone is on board with this transition. People are on board with not going extinct and people are generally on board 
even the climate deniers and like the crazy conservatives overall the the idea is that yes like we all want to live and we all want to continue this community of humanity uh for generations to come but if you're asking people who had nothing to do with the structures that are uh, in place today, who did not pollute this planet, who had nothing to do with this, who have simply been participating in, in a power structure, uh, political reality that, that they're in as uh, actors with no agency, you're asking them to fix the problem and you're saying that, oh, well, it might not happen because we might not get all these people on board and then it will fail. It won't. You, the European Union will, will, will go ahead regardless. But they want, he wants to make it about like how maybe the people are, are the problem. The people are the problem. The European Union isn't the problem. The uh, years of abuse uh, of natural resources isn't the problem. The years of inaction and stupidity and short-sightedness in the European Union, that's not the problem. And I don't just mean the European Union, I mean the world. No, no, none of that is the problem. It's the people, it's their psychology. It's because maybe, maybe they need to be coerced into uh, not buying a car and taking the tram or something. What? It's, it's, decades and hundreds of years of empire and neoliberalism and aggressive American psycho style politics. That's what got us into this into the situation in the first place. And now I want to go back to what he uh, what he told the Guardian again about like that thing that's like so jarring to me where he says that he he would like people to make these sacrifices that it's like we, we haven't learned to make these sacrifices yet. He says, well, we sacrificed a lot because we knew our children would be better off. He's quoting his like grandparents and parents uh, talking about World War II. The, the biggest orgy of destruction and death and human despair ever to happen in Europe the most shameful moment in European history. The reason why the European Union exists is because it's, and it's not even because the European ex Union exists because these horrible things happen and then these people wanted to live in a union and together and, and be friends. No, because these people who did this horror, they, they couldn't trust themselves anymore. There was like this feeling in that zeitgeist that there, this is like a kind of a kind of moment of revelation and this that this is what we're actually capable of okay so let's let's make sure we have checks and balances with each other so we don't do it again there is nothing romantic uh, nothing heroic about oh yeah we sacrifice ourselves for our children these, your grandparents didn't sacrifice themselves for their children. And I mean, if the sacrifice was made, and, and I know people uh, kind of talk about that a lot, but it's like, this, this is not a voluntary sacrifice. These people lived at a time that was horrendous and it was a no choice situation. This is not something, this was like a fate. This, this was like a fateful, horrible, terrible time in history. And to say that we need to go back to that and have that mentality so that to put that kind of mentality upon ourselves in, in the 21st century after all these sacrifices were made by these, by these people who came before us, after these people's lives were ruined, many died. And now we have to go back to that and like, oh, do some sacrifices for what? Based on what? No, the sacrifices need to be made by the powers that be, the corporations, there needs to be fines put on them, There's, there needs to be a whole new structure of how we talk about responsibility in this world. Because it's not, it really is not, and I, I hate this, like, I hate this, like, idea that, oh, you have to make these sacrifices now, you can't drive a car, you can't do this, you can't do that. 
the the amount of contribution we make as uh, average citizens in the world is nothing compared to the big picture and the big structure of, of the world. That is what needs to change. It has nothing to do with the way that people live their lives. And no, I'm sorry. Sorting your bottles between plastic and glass is not going to save the world and it does nothing. It's a BS action. It's a performative action. It's like one of those things that people do uh, when, when they want to calm people down before, um, before impending death. It's when, it's when the pilot on the plane says, oh, it's fine, it's fine, you know, don't worry, don't worry, but, like, the gas, the, the oxygen masks are out, and, like, there's turbulence, but the pilot's saying, yeah, yeah, don't worry, it's just a technical glitch. Because he wants to p keep everyone calm, or she, or they, or anyone in between. But, like, it, this is not going to help. It's not going to, this, none of it is helping. These individual, like individual performative actions are pointless and ridiculous. And, and the more like we busy ourselves with that and the more we like busy ourselves with thinking of if there's something wrong with our psychologies, the more they get away with. And he's like outright saying that this generation is going to have to make sacrifices for the children to come. Well, you know, in a very literal sense, and I'm going to be like very like difficult for five seconds here. I don't have children because I have a conscience and I also have a brain and an, an understanding that we live in a precarious time and having children in this precarious time would have been a bad idea for someone of my generation. But, and now I have to sacrifice myself uh, for, for the, the children of the, uh, you know, like it's just, what is the, what is like, what is, I, what is the limit to the amount of crap that um, people like Timmermans will give us and feed us before they start feeling embarrassed? Like, it's so easy to turn this around. We need to completely resist all of this. Resist the ideology of being responsible personally, you personally being responsible for the planet. We are personally responsible as part of a community and a movement. Whether you want to call it like, left movement, the European Union, whatever, humanity. We as humanity together are, are responsible. But in this oppositional um, structure where uh, Timmermans is somewhere up there and he's like giving money to um, car companies and he's like not penalizing the people who are really responsible for this situation, the corporations, and they're telling you, like pointing down, down at you and saying, oh no, but it's your individual psychological problem. Or like, you need to make sacrifices. No, you do not need to make sacrifices. Always resist this, especially millennials. The millennials have been sacrificed over and over again by people like that, by the corporations, by bank bailouts. No one is bailing us out. No one is helping us. Sacrifice the banks. Sacrifice the corporations. We can afford that. We cannot afford to sacrifice any more people. And this is talking in like the West I'm not even going to mention all the people in other parts of the world, especially those that are affected by climate change because of imperialist corporate practices, how they will suffer. And no, they don't need to sacrifice themselves either. No one needs to be sacrificing themselves. We have the resources, we have the money, we have the ability, and we have the technology to change. There's just no will because there are a very few with corporate interests, with all kinds of interests that make incredible amounts of money and that hold incredible amounts of power with the system as it is now and they don't want to let go of that. No amount of sacrifice is going to save this planet. If we all prostrate ourselves before the powers that be today and sacrifice ourselves on a sacrificial pile, it's not going to change the system and it's not going to save the planet. Or at least it's not going to save us because the planet will survive. Jesus, term, like, uh, I just hate this. And then I, it's just so disgusting that he kind of makes it about World War II and everyone's grandma and grandpa. Like, I don't want them to have made those sacrifices. That was a horrible moment in history. Those were horrible experiences. And that is not something to go back to and say, oh, yeah, we should be more like that. No, let's not be more like that and let's not create a situation where it feels like we're, we're rebuilding an entire civilization after a major war. 
The people he's calling upon, they did not make those decisions. They did not make those choices. People, most people in this world are of good faith, but they have little power. And the ones in power don't have a lot of good faith. Oh no, I nearly forgot to check if Alexei Navalny is still uh, alive and if Denmark is still racist. Uh, let's see, and Navalny is still alive. Well done, Alexei Navalny. Uh, we do this every episode. We check if Alexei Navalny is dead. And yes, Denmark is still racist, still trying to send migrants back to Syria, even though pretty much the entire world agrees it's not safe, but Denmark's insisting because they're racist. Not the people of Denmark. Denmark, the government, Denmark, the ideology. Um, and yeah, congratulations, Alexei, on being alive. And I, I hope uh, you will still be alive next time I see uh, the rest of you. Um, thank you for joining me today. I really appreciate it. This is a totally new thing, new project. It's just like me talking about things. And uh, I'm kind of feeling, feeling the mood for this, feeling out the... Uh, the kind of audience that might be out there for uh, kind of European news and critique. I'm going to try and uh, transition more into uh, uh, cultural topics in the coming weeks. And I just, I just really appreciate you being, uh, appreciate you being here. I think there's a market for transnational and transcontinental politics out there. It's not the best time for uh, political commentators, especially on YouTube. So I appreciate any support you can give me. And, and by that, I just mean uh, subscribe, please. <laughs> just subscribe uh, or follow me on Twitter, Instagram, the usual. If you didn't like the show, um, you can still subscribe and hate watch me. I don't mind. I'm not judgy like that. So um, I just uh, hope you're all feeling good and doing well. And if you're not feeling good, remember, um, there's always a hope at the end of the tunnel. Uh, it's usually a train, um, but sometimes not. Um, Thank you for watching. Thank you for being with me. Thank you for listening. And I will see you next time. In the meantime, stay safe out there.